Take your Bibles, if you will, please, and turn to the book of Hebrews. Find it over in the the right-hand section of your New Testament. If you get to some of those smaller books like uh, 1 and 2 Peter or 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, you've gone too far, just go back to the left a little bit, okay? Hebrews chapter 1. <clears throat> and today, I'll read through verse 4, but our focus will be on verses 1 through 3 <clears> of <throat> Hebrews chapter 1. And so if you found that place, if you'll follow along, I'll read. This is the word of God. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. This is the word of God. And as we look together in this text, I'm, I'm mindful that I've said to you more than once lately that 2020 has been a, a difficult year in a lot of ways. We didn't anticipate the things that have taken place. I, I remember in January mentioning to you that we wanted to pray for people who had been infected by a virus, an, a new virus that had come on the scene, who were in China, and there were hundreds of people who were being affected. We wanted to pray for them. Um, now, months later, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, have been affected not infected, but affected. We didn't see that coming. Um, there have been some pastoral things this year that I just did not see coming that have been hard. Um, there have been some things in our family, personally, that we never saw coming. We, we never thought we would walk through some of the things that we've walked through this year. Um, there are things going on in our country that we didn't see coming. I don't think any of us anticipated riots in the streets and people burning each other's property and attacking one another. I don't think any of us saw the difficulties that have come. Maybe, maybe we did anticipate the difficulties of the election here. I, uh, that was probably a little easier to see as we looked to the, the election that happens in just a few days. With all those things that have been going on this year, um, it makes me feel a little bit like we're living in the days of the judges that we kept talking about as we walked through Ruth. You know, days of, of a little bit, I'm, I'm not saying we're in days of anarchy, but it feels like that sometimes when everybody's doing what seems right in their own eyes. Feels like things are chaotic and out of control. And so in the next nine weeks, we want to uh, examine together, not verse by verse, but uh, nine particular sections of the book of Hebrews. And um, I want to do that for two reasons. I'm, I was planning, honestly, to preach, to begin to preach a short series through Proverbs. Because as we think about all of the difficulty of relating to one another and living in this culture and making decisions and even responding to whatever comes from the election and all the fallout from that, we're going to need a lot of wisdom. And we don't just need our own wisdom and position established to, to shoot back and forth at each other, but we need God's wisdom for those things. Um, but I'm going to wait until January to preach on those things, so you'll just have to wait for wisdom, I guess, until the new year. Because I also want us to know and worship and honor Jesus more fully in these days. Especially as we enter the Christmas season and think about the celebration of, of the incarnation, God clothing himself in flesh, 
we want to <clears throat> be a people who don't just have little jingly phrases about Christmas, but we want to be people who love and exalt and honor Jesus Christ, God clothed in the flesh. And then I also am praying that we would be filled with confidence and hope during days of uncertainty and chaos. You see, the recipients of this book, the letter to the Hebrews, are walking in those kinds of days. They are followers of Christ, predominantly Jewish, but not, a, not exclusively. There are Gentiles, I believe, in the congregation that received this letter. And we're not exactly sure where they are, um, but possibly in Rome. And so those who will be or have been facing significant persecution and chaos in their own culture simply because of following Christ. And so it was written to encourage them as they faced that difficulty and persecution. And I want us to be a people who are full of confidence and hope in, those da in these days. And I think that, that we can begin to move in that direction as we look at this book together in, in a brief way because it speaks to God's revelation in Christ and it, it addresses that immediately in verse 1 and it does it in significant ways in the first and second half of the book. But then it also speaks to God's redemption through Christ and that it, it addresses in verse 3 and then significantly in the center portion of the book. Now I want to encourage you, there, there are two parts to the sermon today. We want to think about God's revelation in Christ and God's redemption through Christ. And it's almost 90% weighted on that first point. So I don't want you to, to get a long way into point number one and, and go, oh no, we're, we're going to be here until Jesus does come back um, to redeem us. So I'm going to primarily think, because there will be much to say about the redemption that is ours in Christ coming in Hebrews. So we want to spend the primary part of our time in, in terms of the revelation of God, that God has spoken finally, fully, and sufficiently to us in Christ. But we'll also think about the fact that Jesus is the redemption promised by God, and we, need have, no, we have no need to look beyond Him for rescue and provision in days of need. So let's, let's think about those things together. First of all, thinking about the revelation of God that is found in Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you to look at the text with me, particularly in verse 1. Long ago, and I'm, I'm just going to kind of pause as we work through this, this little phrase. Long ago, at many times and in many ways. Okay, so, in the past, God spoke, and He did it in some limited ways, in limited times, um, and in, in to some particular people. So, our, uh, the first thing I want you to see out of this text is that God spoke in the past to a limited group of people, to the fathers, in a limited kind of way, by the prophets. So human beings hearing from God or representing God to his people and communicating to them that which God had revealed. And then he goes on, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So we'll think also in just a minute about the fact that God has spoken finally through the son. But first, God spoke in the past. Now, the Bible is to be taken entirely or as a whole. Um, I, I think that many times we tend to think about the Bible, especially the Old Testament, as a loose connection of or a loose gathering of disconnected stories. But the Bible is in fact a single unit, and if we would divide it in any sense, we would say that in the Old Testament, we hear from God His promises of a Redeemer, and then in the New Testament, we see the fulfillment of those promises in the person and work of Christ. That's the only real division I would make in the Scriptures. And the first glimpse we get 
of God's divine plan is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Here we have the, the first expression of the gospel and the promise that God is going to crush Satan through the seed of a woman. And he makes that promise and then the rest of the Bible is sort of a commentary on Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. As the promise of God is unfolded and revealed and uncovered and explained little bit by little bit by little bit over a, an extended period of time. So we see this promise to Abraham of an offspring or a seed of a woman who will be the blessing to the nations. And we see God preserving the line of his people as he delivers them um, through Joseph, and we see God delivering them again from their bondage in Egypt. We see God making a provision for them at Mount Sinai as he gives to them ceremonies and sacrifices. The people experienced fellowship with God, but always at a distance. Always at a distance. This heavy veil was there between those who could even get that close and the very presence of God in the Holy of Holies. And so there's this all this, this closeness to God and yet always a distance. It's as though there's this, these, these constant shadows and types and figures of what God is going to do. But they're like the, the revelations of the sunrise that you get in the morning and the dawn when they're just sort of fingers of light. And you can see that there's, there's a sun out there somewhere, but you don't see it in all of its fullness and all of its glory. Just little stabs of finger breaking through the darkness. And these messengers that I mentioned to you a minute ago, this limited revelation, if you will, as God spoke to his people, were men like us, sinners, gifted and set apart by God to communicate his word with God's people. And they spoke with limited understanding. They spoke things that were absolutely true for their day, but also had oftentimes a larger, fuller sense of truth. So that as they spoke to God's people, they were also uncovering the promises and the provision that God was going to make. There was a promise of a consolation to God's people. And yet, it was not there. They talked about the sacrifices and the commands regarding the sacrifices and the ceremonies that God had commanded. And I would encourage you to understand that God's people were saved in the Old Testament exactly like you and I are. By faith alone. And they expressed their faith through their obedience to the commands that God had given them. As much light as God gave, they walked. And they believed the light, the light that God gave. They understood that a sacrifice would be necessary in order for their sins to be forgiven. They did not hope in the sacrifices they made. They hoped in the God who had commanded them to trust that he would ultimately provide forgiveness for them through a sacrifice. So the, the, the way that God spoke in the Old Testament was good, but in a sense not complete. He spoke in limited ways through limited prophets with limited content. In the past, God spoke. But now, notice how the text goes on and changes in verse 2. But in these last days, and friends, that's not like the last seven days of something, but he's speaking to the age from the time of Christ's first coming in which we now live until his second coming. These last days or this last age is what the author references there. And so he's saying, in these days right now where you live, God has spoken. Now, I'm saying that that communicates to us that this change in language says that God has spoken with nothing held back. He is no longer speaking in types or figures or shadows or in limited ways or through a limited messenger, but he has spoken, the text literally says, in Son. He has spoken in Christ. So 
Nothing held back. Everything that the Old Testament promised or pointed to, the author is telling us, is fulfilled or uncovered or revealed or explained, or now the Son has fully exposed itself in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So, notice too that he's not spoken to a representative or to an intermediary. Verse 2 says, in these last days he has spoken to us. And so, you're no longer looking to a representative to communicate to you what God wants you to know, but you are hearing God speak in Son, in Christ, through His Word. Now the intention of that language is to communicate that God has spoken finally and fully and sufficiently and that He will say no more than He has said in Christ, in Son. And so what He says, He has said fully and completely and He says it to all. This is why I would encourage you to be careful when you say that God speaks audibly. In fact, I would say that God does not speak audibly or independently to anyone anymore apart from His Word. What He says, He says to us all in the Scriptures. Now, I want to be careful there. and I, It does not mean that God never encourages you in your own heart by the reading of the Scriptures. It doesn't mean that God doesn't bring to mind Scripture or use another Christian to encourage you or to remind you, hey, I've got this, or I'm going to take care of you, or I'm providing for you. It doesn't mean that, that God never communicates, but He does it through His Word. He never communicates differing messages independently to people that would be contradictory to His Word, he never does things that would be uh, in confliction or uh, difference from each other. He communicates consistently to all in His Son. He has spoken in His Son. And I would encourage you to think about, about it this way. It's not that, that Je- just that Jesus was the final messenger. He is the final message. So when Ezekiel the prophet portrayed the glory of God in his writing... In the Old Testament, Christ reflects that glory to us in His person. John put it this way, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Isaiah spoke of the nature of God as holy and righteous and merciful. He wrote those things for us, but Christ manifests those very things to us. And as we look on Christ, we look at holiness, righteousness, and perfection. We see the perfection of God in Christ. Jeremiah describes the power of God, but Christ is the very display of the power of God so that when Jesus speaks, the elements obey. When Jesus speaks, sick people get better. When Jesus speaks, dead people stand up and walk. When Jesus speaks, demons tremble as the reflection that He is God and is the very power of God. So as a result, Peter and James and John stand on the mount with Jesus and they hear with Jesus standing there from God, This is my Son. Listen to Him. So this declaration from God is that the one who surpasses the prophets of old has come on the scene. His message for these last days is distinctive. Listen to him. There is a superiority and an urgency in his message. And there will be no further revelation than that which we find in Christ. He is the final, supreme, last instruction that we will hear from God. Before Christ, all things look forward to His coming. Now all things look back to Him. He is the center of history. He is the the one around whom all things revolve. So, as we think about this text and, and what I am saying that it communicates to us, why do we care? So So what? I have real problems. You're talking to me from a theological ivory tower. No. 
Friends, I believe that one reason we can be filled with hope and confidence in our day is because we have God's final word with regard to the problem of sin. Because every brokenness in the world that we are tasting, every brokenness that you are experiencing in your own life today is a result of sin. Maybe not necessarily your own sin in a one-to-one way, but the brokenness and fallenness of the world is what we are feeling and experiencing and tasting every day. Things are not as they ought to be because of sin. And we have the final word of God with regard to how sin is dealt with. Now let me just apply that a little more specifically. There's, there's a great deal of brokenness in our society, but one of the particular ways that we've been <clears throat> called to be aware of lately is this whole issue of, of race and injustice and, and those kinds of things. And so I thought, what is the biblical language speaking to those things? If, if this text is telling us that God has spoken in a final way, what has he said about those things? For instance, through the prophets. Well, through one prophet, God said, The people of the land have practiced extortion and committed robbery. They have oppressed the poor and needy and have extorted from the sojourner without justice. Now, that's not made up language from our current culture. Or another prophet says, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Jesus said, you ought to clothe the naked, visit the prisoners, feed the hungry, and as much as you do this to the least of these, you've done it to me. So we hear this claim again in the New Testament to be aware of things that are going on around us in our culture that is a result of the brokenness of sin. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to wash ourselves? How are we going to make ourselves clean? How are we going to respond to those things around us? Well, let me declare in no uncertain terms that our church nor our pastors doesn't, that's not really, that's really bad grammar, neither of the pastors nor our church, maybe that's the way to say this, we don't embrace critical race theory or cultural Marxism or any of the silly theories that our culture is currently coming up with to try to address these things. But we would not pretend that the same plague sins that plagued Ezekiel and Isaiah's day do not plague our day. And so we will, with other faithful followers of Jesus, denounce the sins of prejudice and bigotry and sexual immorality and all kinds of abuse, whether they are existing in our lives or in the lives of those that are around us. We want to address those things. And with faithful followers of Jesus, we will embrace the revelation of God embodied in Christ as the final and sufficient authority to, to address all sin in all its forms in every place at every time that there is no other solution for sin apart from Jesus and his saving work in our lives. So we need to be working out the, the, the need for redemption in our own lives and then calling for the provision of the gospel in the lives of those that are around us. We have to be attending to these things in practical ways by calling people out of and away from their hardship and trying to address it as God gives us ability to do that. And we ought to be addressing those things with the gospel. We have every hope that these things can be addressed. I don't think fully and finally and that we're going to live in some utopia one day, but we can be hopeful that the gospel rescues people out of their sins and changes their hearts. We can also have great hope because Jesus is God and he's moving all things toward their intended end. Look at, at the end of chapter 2, or the mid, mid part of, I'm sorry, not chapter 2, verse 2. God has spoken to us in Son, or by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. You know, just so that we're not here until Tuesday, can you trust me and say that, that the author is telling us that, that Jesus is God? in that phrase. He is the, both the beginning and the end of all things. 
And then notice in verse 3, he says that he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And by that, he means that the very essence of God belongs to Jesus. Just like the warmth and the light of the sun don't exist apart from the sun, and the sun doesn't exist apart from its radiance of warmth and light, the Son, Jesus, does not exist apart from the Father, nor the Father from the Son. They are one, and yet they are distinct persons. And if you want to know what God, who has not a body like man and cannot be seen with human eyes, looks like, you look at Jesus. Because he bears the exact imprint or stamp of God on himself. If you want to know how, G how God would, would respond or move or do or what he is, you look to Jesus. He is the creator and the heir of all things. And then go on and notice that he says, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. That phrase means that Jesus who is God, God himself is moving all things toward the end that he decrees or ordains. Don't get the mental picture of Jesus like Atlas holding up the world. Maybe a little more helpful mental picture would be a divine weaver who takes a billion living threads and is weaving them into a tapestry. And we only see the tapestry from behind and beneath. You know, you see the, the tufts of thread and the, the stuff coming through, and the, the, you don't really can't make out the patterns or the distinct things that are going on on the other side. You just see the little bits and parts of it. And yet there is one who is pulling all these things together according to his own designs and decrees. Because he is God who made the world and will rule the world as his everlasting kingdom. And he is moving it toward that end that he desires. Now again, as we think about that, you may be going, so what? Well, I think we ought to be, we ought to be hopeful and encouraged and have confidence because we might perceive that everything is out of control. But it's not. We may perceive that, you know, day after tomorrow or whenever that happens, if our candidate doesn't get elected, whoever that is, if our candidate doesn't get elected, everything is just going to go straight out of control into chaos, anarchy, civil war. Friends, nothing is going to be out of control. Jesus is moving all things toward his intended end. And it doesn't mean it's always going to be comfortable. <laughs> or let me just drive a little closer to home. Maybe you're, you're one of those people who's walking through the difficulties that we've been talking about. Just all of life is crushing you right now. Maybe you feel like a failure. Maybe you're, you're, you're just like everybody else in the room and you're thinking, boy, I didn't see this coming. <laughs> I didn't think this is where I'd be now. Friend, it's not out of control. God is at work moving all these things toward his designed purposes and end. Think about it this way. You may feel that, that the final word is pain or difficulty or disaster or failure. But Jesus is and has the final word. Story's not finished yet. And he is working all these things toward the end that he desires. Well, Jesus is the very revelation of God, but also Jesus is the Redeemer promised by God. Notice the last part of verse 3. After making purification for sins... He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. In the Old Testament, the prophet represented God to man by communicating God's word. And as we've been talking about, Jesus is the better and the consummate prophet. 
But now the text is reminding us in the Old Testament, the priests represented men to God, bringing sacrifices on their behalf to God as he had commanded. But friends, what we're going to learn as we walk through the book of Hebrews together over these next few weeks, nine weeks, is that Jesus is the consummate high priest. And not only does he have the final word, he has made the final sacrifice. Because the text tells us that after having made this sacrifice, he sat down at the right hand of God. Let me remind you quickly that when Adam and Eve sinned against God in the garden, they ran and hid themselves and tried to, to hide from God, and, the, and they tried to cover themselves with leaves. And God communicated to them in very clear terms that they were never going to be able to either hide from Him or make the problem of their disobedience and transgression go away. And so God provided for them a covering. And when God killed an animal and gave to them the skin of that animal, He wasn't just making a fashion statement that leather is better than leaves. God was saying to them, for your sin to be covered and dealt with, death has to take place. And if you are not going to die for your sin, another must die in your place. And thus began the endless stream of human priests offering an endless stream of sacrifices, animal after animal after animal, sacrificed because of sin and yet never accomplishing the need that they pictured. And so as we look to the Lord Jesus Christ, this verse is telling us something you've heard here over and over and will hear again in the next weeks. Jesus is the perfect and consummate and superior high priest who has gone into the very presence of God, not with the sacrifice of an animal, but with the sacrifice of himself, shedding his own blood so that you might go free from the penalty of your sin. And there is never another need for any other sacrifice. You need not look beyond Jesus for your rescue because he has demonstrated the sufficiency of that sacrifice by sitting down at the right hand of the majesty and the glory of God. And there he will be for all eternity, so that you might be for all eternity in his presence. No more separation, no more veil, no more types and shadows and figures, and no more sin separating you from him. Thanks be to God for so great a salvation. And so friends, Again, as we think about these things, these lofty theological truths, we ask the question, so what? Well, this is my longing and desire as we think about these things. First of all, I pray that God would grant us to hate sin more. Considering that Jesus has taken on flesh and suffered and died, in order to be the final rescue of sinners. Do you need today to look to Him in faith for the very first time where you are, as you are, and ask Him to forgive you of your sin? And to literally raise you from the dead? And give you life in Christ so that then you might pursue Him and walk with Him in the joy and the provision of His great sacrifice? Or... Are you a follower of Jesus who is tormented by a besetting sin? Are you wrestling against something that keeps coming over and over and over? Friend, would you believe today that Jesus' death is sufficient to rescue you from even that? You don't need something beyond Jesus to rescue you from besetting sin. Secondly, I hope that God would grant us grace to love Jesus more. I just pray that we would, we would be more and more amazed at who He is 
and what he has done. That we would somehow be able to move from thinking about Jesus just as somebody who did something over there as, and, and start thinking about him as one who has come to dwell within us in the person of the Spirit of God. To strengthen, enable, help, encourage, convict, rebuke, strengthen, and transform by his power and for his glory. And that our love for Christ would trump our love for any other redeemer. And then finally, I pray that you would just long to please him and honor him and glorify him out of your love for him. Not out of any desire to earn anything from him. Not out of any, you know, sort of treadmill thing of trying to think, well, I, I, gotta, I gotta do more, I gotta do more. If I could just do a little more, then everything would be perfect. Now, would, would you just follow Christ because you love him? I pray that that would be true. To the praise and glory of his grace. Let's pray together. Father, to the, the glory and honor of Jesus Christ, we ask that you would save sinners today, that you would help people see, maybe for the very first time, that there is no provision for their sin apart from Christ. Would you help struggling saints believe and love Jesus more today? And Father, would you then also... Um, Engage us in obedience out of our love for Christ. That's going to mean a lot of different things for different people today. We need to walk away from some idols and false gods that we've set up. We need to speak up on behalf of some other person. We need to enter into the suffering of another who, is, who needs a friend, someone to come alongside them. We need to love a spouse better. We need to parent a child better. We need to love and honor a parent better. Uh, we need to be more faithful as employees. There, there are just a, a jillion ways that we can think about that. So would you help us today to think about how we might engage in following after you because we love you and we want to honor you would you do that for the praise of your own glory we ask it in Christ's name amen